So that's uh, Charlie Dallin. Conrad Humphreys then, uh, Charlie Dallin celebrating with a chicken curry and a chicken, chicken tikka masala. He's practically English. He certainly is, yeah. I think uh, I think Mike Golding would probably uh, celebrate with the curry as well. He seems to... Uh, well, there you go. Uh, anyway, Conrad, tell us a little bit about Captain Bly then in April 1788. It was a very different uh, time then when the sailors going round uh, Cape Horn the other way. Yeah, certainly was. Uh, he, he, Captain Bly, arrived in HMS Bounty in a sort of late March, uh, no, early March, in fact. Uh, and normally their route into the Pacific would be via the Cape and they'd sail to Tahiti uh, and then from there go off about their business. His particular mission was to go and collect some breadfruit from, from uh, Tahiti. And they got to Cape Horn and, and literally spent a month beating against headwinds uh, to no avail. Eventually, they gave up, turned around and sailed back to uh, to Cape of Good Hope and then continued all the way around the world to Tahiti via uh, the, all of the Great Capes. So, um, yeah, diff different time, different boats. Different boats. I mean, what, what would they have to wear in those days? I mean, we have uh, Gore-Tex and our... our uh... Our teams are all fully protected now, generally, at, uh, at Cape Horn. They're mostly indoors a lot of the time. <laughs> what was life yeah, like Yeah, well, you can, uh, you, you can see this old picture here of, uh, of, 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 of a, you know, a, a boat like HMS Bounty going around the Horn. And, uh, you know, they're not really wearing, wearing very much in the way of protection. Um, certainly no life jackets on any of those sailors that, that I can see. Um, hanging on for grim death, probably. So, yeah, they would have been wet, cold pretty miserable and uh and just yeah not really going very fast at all which is why the the, the clipper boats eventually realized that this wasn't the way forward and tell us a, bit, a little bit about the the mutiny then because you uh, you obviously recreated the voyage in your in your own uh, expedition yeah well of course as Bly then continued on to uh uh to to tonga eventually well to tahiti and then on to tonga um, where uh, there was a big argument on board the boat and the younger Christian Fletcher took command and forced Bly and uh, uh, 18 sailors into the small ship's um, launch and, uh, and left him for dead. Uh, and then he continued from there to navigate all the way to Timor, uh, a voyage of about 45 days, kept all his men alive and uh, just, yeah, one of the most remarkable voyages, really historical voyages of survival that, that uh, we've seen. And, and a few years ago, we got to recreate that voyage for, uh, for a Channel 4 uh, programme. So, um, yeah, really fascinating to sort of navigate traditionally and survive in a little open boat for, for 50 days and see what it was like. What was it like? Uh, it was, you know, it had, it had its mix of everything. I mean, actually, the sailing side was uh, was was okay. I mean, you know, you consider at times we were, you know, in the middle of the Coral Sea, fourteen hundred miles from land. You know, quite precarious um, situations at times. Um, obviously, the crew that I was with were were cast for Channel Four, so they, you know, they they weren't uh, seasoned sailors. Uh, a real mix of experience. And that gave it gave you know a, a fair amount of challenges, but um, it 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 was it was great. I mean, I uh, actually to be at sea for that length of time in a little open boat was um, you know not dissimilar <laughs> from uh, from being in the Vendée Globe in terms of of just enduring that experience. Uh, but obviously the speeds were very different. And uh, what do you remember about your Vendée Globe at uh, at Cape Horn? Well, funny enough, uh, I I remember uh, quite a bit before Cape Horn because as I was uh, about three days before Cape Horn, I had probably the worst storm of the race for me. Um, and in fact, you know, you were chatting to Pip Hare the other day. I got knocked down in that storm and lost my wand from the top of the rig. Uh, and eventually, I managed to put a wand on the back of the boat, uh, and and but it meant for the for the duration of the race, you know, I was struggling with wind information uh, to the pilots and so on. So uh, yeah, when when you when you chatted to Pip about that, 
I was sort of sympathizing with her because it's a long, long way to go without having uh, any wind information coming into your pilot system. Now listen, Conrad, we've got a little uh, question from the internet for you specifically. And the question is, uh, how different is, uh, is this race to your race in 2004 or the, indeed the 2004-2005 edition in particular? Well, there are quite, some quite considerable differences. Um, I mean, I think uh, the, the, you, you spoke to Josh, uh, Joff, sorry, Joss, uh, Seb Joss earlier about the, the ice gates. We, we had sort of ice, um, the ice gates, not an ice, ice line. And so it meant we had a lot more freedom with sailing. And in fact, during that race, you know, I saw four or five icebergs, um, which of course the fleet don't tend to, to see at all now. Uh, the, the the Pacific Ocean, uh, very similar this time round, but I think the Indian Ocean was was dramatically different. You know, we had a lot of depressions in the Indian Ocean, whereas uh, this race has been um, punctuated with high pressure, uh, big high pressure systems, and of course the low pressures have been below the ice line. So um, it's been very, very tactical, very, very interesting. And of course, you know, right now we've got this incredible fleet of boats together going around Cape Horn, a mix of you know, 2008, 2007, FAR and Finos with the, the new Verdiers. So um, it's, it's been fascinating to watch. Do you want to predict an outcome? Um, well, <laughs> I, you know, it's complex in the South Atlantic. Um, you know, it's it's. I think if the boats end up reaching it on the wind, then it's going to be hard to find a way past the two front boats. Uh, but um, you know, if it remains complicated, you know, we saw just how effective Damien Seguin and and Jean Le Cam and in fact um, Benjamin Dutroux, you know, they're all sailing incredibly well. They're sailing their boats to the best performance. So I, I wouldn't rule them out at this stage. And, and the other thing is, you know, there's still quite a lot of racetrack to go. Historically, you know, boats will still pull out of the race yeah, at yeah. this stage, you know. I think that's one of the things we kind of forget is there's still plenty of uh, chances for boats to break down in the uh, South Atlantic and indeed even we've seen, you know, close to home. So there, there's plenty more left, isn't there? We, we have. I mean, if you think of the keel failures, uh, both in the South and in the North Atlantic and, you know, boats finishing, you know, without their keels sailing, you know, in some cases, a thousand miles with uh, in that situation. So, I, I, you know, I wouldn't rule out any of those sort of top eight or nine boats at this stage. Um, you know, they, they, they certainly need to keep pushing hard because, you know, victory could be in sight. So you're not making any bets for us then? <laughs> no, no bets. Um, no, no, they're, they're all off at this for this race, which is great. It's the way you know it, it should be. Indeed, Conrad. Thank you so much for joining us. Enjoy your Sunday in uh, in Plymouth. I hope the weather's a little bit better than it is here in Les Sables de Lone. Thank you, Conrad.